the whole world gave lip service support to the two-state solution while seeing it disappearing, while seeing the Palestinian state disappearing on the ground. The right in Israel is strengthening because it also includes the territories. People uh, see that it's actually a, a very worthwhile project for Jews. They get more land for free, they steal it from the Palestinians. The idea is that there will be two states, but the two states will have open borders. There will be freedom of movement between them. Later on also freedom of residence, um, and uh, possibly even one economy, to have the belonging, to have the uh, uh, connection to all parts of the land. The two nations can get the self-determination because the homeland is shared the perception of the homeland of Jews and Palestinians is the same between the Jordan and the sea. This is, by, by the way, not particularly new. The UN decision from 1947 says two states with an economic union, with freedom of movement. What needs to be done uh, to make these good ideas happen is, of course, the $42 million question. First of all is to change the discourse. And the discourse has been wrongly framed for a long time because of Israel's immense power both that Israel is a democracy, not to mention the only democracy in the, in the Middle East. This is wrong, factually. There's no equal citizenship. Democracy is a much more accurate, but more than that, we have to also look at the colonial project, right? We have to look at the colonization of Palestine, not as a border dispute. This is a regime that the Jews have come from Europe and then from the Arab world, and have colonized Palestine. This has to change the discourse in academia, in uh, civil society, in the media. Uh, it is a colonial project not dissimilar to the French in Algiers or to the British in, in Ireland or to the Germans in Poland. Part that is gaining ground because it reflects reality. We call for minimal disruptions and uprooting. So this is, of course, it will be up to Palestinians to decide. But it's quite realistic that the Palestinian under an agreement would say to the Jewish settlers, you know, if you accept Palestinian rule, if you pay for the land that you stole or whatever, or you hire the land from the landowners, you can stay under Palestinian rule. And the same, of course, to stop all uprooting of Palestinians, like Israel is trying to do, especially in where I live, in the Negev, which is a massive uprooting of people that Israel threatens all the time. So we, we think while it looks maybe uh, to some people utopian, actually it's more realistic to say, let's hang on with the geography, change the rules of the game, uh, and uh, uh, will create a much better situation. Um, and then, of course, uh, to actually make it happen, you need the two elements of power. You need the powers from below and you need it from above. So from below you need, there's no way around it, to engage, to work on the ground with Israelis and Palestinians, that the majority of whom are interested in peace. The whole world gave lip service support to the two-state solution while seeing it disappearing, while seeing the Palestinian state disappearing on the ground. It's almost scandalous the way Israel is exceptionalized in international law. Every country around the world that breaks international law uh, is being uh, called to order, it's being uh, condemned, it's being uh, uh, sanctioned, and only, the only exception is Israel. Now, I'm not saying only Israel is responsible for it, only the US, of course, they are the two strongest players. Other countries, France, UK, Germany, and especially Germany and the UK, I might, I might add. Two of them are directly responsible to what happened to the Palestinians. Both Germany with the Holocaust, which has driven Jews in a most tragic way to their ancient homeland, and Britain that created the, you know, the Balfour Declaration and the conditions for uh, Jewish colonization of Palestine. And both these countries do very, very little and very powerful. Um, I sat as the head of B'Tselem, I sat a few times with Tony Blair. He became ambassador of the uh, quartet to Palestine. And basically he was doing very, very little. And Angela Merkel is probably the most powerful woman in the world now. She can wield a lot of power and she refrains from doing that. So it has to be uh, mobilized on this kind of level. Then the European Union is still a source of hope because it's the center of human rights in the world, it's the center of democracy in the world and peace. 
but it has to do much, much more that is done to, to mark some products from the settlements or some very weak. Hopeful window is that Israel is trying to be a global state. It's not a marginal state in the periphery of the world. Israel is premised on being a global state in science, in technology, in, in weapon industry, in trade. It is a very successful state economically. And this is a point of negotiation. The, the terms of trade with Europe, for example, is, is, is very much, uh, you don't have to go to boycotts, you don't have to go to extremes. You can start with questioning the privileges that Israel, Israel has with Europe, both with trade or with uh, science. Um, and that will create a lot of angst in Israel, just these kind of privileges that are put under question mark. Uh, so I think overall the movement from below, from the ground, coupled with international mobilization in the name of the standards and uh, the principles that govern world governance. I'm a believer that we need to strengthen very much the urban cooperation to create metropolitan frameworks and this of course gradually through a lot of struggles uh, can um, bring people together, break the boundaries uh, and, and, and create joint agenda, joint mobilization uh, to create a better future because both Palestinians and Jews are there for the foreseeable future for the next few hundred years so we better find ways to coexist uh, on good terms.